Okay, we should be live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we're just gonna verify that before we get started. Um, we are going to be live on the Alabama Museum of Natural History's Facebook page. So if you are on Facebook, welcome. Uh, and uh, we are also going to be live from the UA Museum's YouTube channel. So if you prefer, I know some people prefer to, <laughs> to watch through YouTube uh, just because it's more accessible that way in case you don't have a Facebook account, uh, you can watch it on YouTube, but through the UA Museum's YouTube channel. It does look like we are live on YouTube. I'm just gonna double check that on Facebook. We are live on Facebook. So uh, welcome to anybody who is watching with us this morning. So I guess I will go ahead and get us started so we can get talking about our uh, discussion today. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I'm the communication specialist for UA Museums. And uh, joining me this morning uh, uh, for a discussion about the Alabama Rivers and Streams Network is Allie Sorley, Education Outreach Coordinator at the Alabama Museum of Natural History and members of the Geological Survey of Alabama and the Surface Dynamics Modeling Lab at the University of Alabama. Uh, Allie, would you like to introduce our guest this morning? Yeah, I'd love to. So today we have with us, we have uh, Stuart McGregor. He's the director of the Ecosystems Investigations Program at the Geologic Survey. We have Rebecca Bearden. She is an aquatic biologist at the Ecosystems Investigations Program at the Geologic Survey of Alabama. We have Henry Pitts, who is an undergrad research assistant um, at the Surface Dynamics Modeling Lab, um, UA in the Geography Department. And then we have Austin Rainey, who's a graduate research uh, assistant at the Surface Dynamics uh, Modeling Lab at, in UA at the Geography Department. So we're really excited to have everyone here. Yes, thank you all for joining us Excellent. this morning. And uh, so before we get started, mm -hmm. Allie, I, I just want to remind everybody that we are live here on Facebook and YouTube uh, on the UA Museums YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, feel free to ask us any questions uh, while the conversation is happening. You can do that. That's the fun part of the uh, live component is that you can interact with the, uh, the folks on the live stream. Uh, and as a reminder, because it is live, anything can happen. So hang in there with us in case Facebook has any issues or YouTube has any issues or we have any connection issues. Hopefully that will not be the case, uh, but just be patient with us in case that happens. All right, so now that we've uh, gotten all of that business out of the way, uh, Allie, how should we get started in this conversation today? Yeah, I think um, we've got, we're gonna kind of talk about um, the um, Alabama Rivers and Streams Network with, with everyone here. I think the reason we wanted to have this great conversation is because our state is a wonderful state for water resources. And I think it's something that people um, are know about, but are happy to learn a little bit more about. And so we thought this conversation might be one that um, would be great to talk about and to share with everyone all the wonderful work that's going on um, to protect our water resources and um, to research them and find as much out about them as possible, which is what all these lovely people in the chat do. So we're excited about that. Um, so the Alabama Rivers and Streams Network, we keep saying that a lot, but that's kind of here what we're here to talk about today. Um, Stuart, I think you want to get us started and kind of let us know what that is. I think we're going to use the acronym ARSEN, right, a lot if we hear that said, that's Alabama Rivers and Streams. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and how it got started? Okay, sure. Uh, well, in the... Uh, somewhat to now some people distant past, there was a fellow named uh, Paul Hartfield, still works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over in Jackson, Mississippi, and he had come up with a recovery plan for the Mobile River Basin, focused on the mussels, the rare mussel fauna there, and that was sort of the seed for the program, and when um, Jeff Powell came along into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service down in Daphne, he called Pat O'Neill, our former deputy director of the survey and our my supervisor for many years, retired last year and they had a long conversation as Pat was traveling out west on a family vacation about taking that what Paul created and moving forward with a, a, an over-encompassing plan to achieve the goals of recovery as part of the Endangered Species Act there's a recovery objective you know the idea is to get them off the list so one of the components of that was in the beginning if you can put those maps up that I sent to you do you have that slide yes. uh, the first uh, we came up with a map for 11 species of mussels in the uh, Mobile River Basin that had critical habitat designated. And that is somebody in 
somewhere, I don't know who decided, but from point A to point B was where those mussels were known. So they consider that critical habitat. That's a component of the Endangered Species Act. Of course, we all know that everything that goes into that stream reach affects that fauna. So we uh, came up with the idea of strategic habitat units, shoes, and that is uh, made a map. Ann Wynn, who used to work with us, made the map of the Mobile River Basin and the designated critical habitats for those 11 species of mussels. And that is capturing the entire watershed from the lower end of where they occur in their designated critical habitat. And it's important to remember that critical habitat under the Endangered Species Act has legal ramifications. It has power. Our uh, opinion of strategic habitat units is just our opinion. We believe that this, it has no, you know, there's no power that goes with it, no legal authority. Um, so after a few years, that I think we created that map in 2010. In 2012, we decided to expand the entire state and add uh, streams outside the Mobile River Basin and that flow into or out of Alabama. The only one here that doesn't have any uh, direct connection to Alabama is the Upper Coosa River system, but it does eventually flow into Alabama. But we added streams outside the state that flow into or out of the state as well. In the rest of the state, that, Is that was our next picture. Yes, that was in 2012. Two years later, we created this map and expanded to the entire state. And we expanded beyond just mussels. Mussels are the driving force, but we added fish to some degree, reptiles, crayfish, uh, other things, uh, salamanders. And there is a website, I'm sure Rebecca will talk about that later, that supports how these were determined. And they are based upon the presence or the recent presence of critically endangered or imperiled species at some level, some priority one and priority two conservation species in the state as well. And where we think focus needs to be put for research and uh, restoration efforts uh, to get the best bang for the buck, so to speak, for uh, protecting and enhancing those habitats. And if you'll show the next one, in 2018, we expanded it once again, uh, new data, new taxonomy, yeah. and captured some other streams that are outside the state altogether, like down in Florida, you'll see some that don't flow into, right out, into or out of Alabama, but they are in a system that does flow into or out of the state. And we base this upon not just the federal protection and the Alabama state listed priority status, but also those for Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida. So that was a Pat took on the bulk of that, building the database that supported this, and Ann did a spectacular job building these maps. And uh, they are for distribution. I think the first map is out of print, and the second one probably doesn't have a lot left, but this one is uh, available for free at the Geological Survey of Alabama. And um, so we have gotten funding through the years, basically from Fish and Wildlife Service, to uh, do research in these uh, shoes. And that's been focused through or, or uh, funneled through Kawako, the RCND out of Birmingham in recent years. But people, we encourage people all around the state to take a lead on perhaps, might say, doing research in the streams and writing up a watershed management plan for those. We've had, a, we used the North River watershed here in Tuscaloosa sort of as a pilot project because it was local to Tuscaloosa. And Mary Pitts from the university was our uh, person yeah. there. She was spectacular. I wish we had a Mary Pitts in every watershed in the state. Um, we have local sport now, Atlanta uh, Reynolds, who used to work at the survey now, TNC there. She's kind of taking the lead on that watershed and in the Big Canoe Creek and others. And there's there's, a, there's too many people to thank along the way for the work they're doing. But uh, Jeff Ray of the University of North Alabama is doing a spectacular job with fishes and the Cypress and Shoal Creek systems. And we've had people at West Alabama and the Sukunachi and over in Auburn working in the Chattahoochee and thereabouts. So, uh, and then uh, Michael Stewart and others down at Troy that have done things in the past uh, around Southeast Alabama and Fish and Wildlife Service and Daphne uh, works a lot with those nearby. So we have a really good, um, cadre of cohorts and, and Rebecca will give you more detail on that later but it's an umbrella organization it doesn't have any official capacity it's just you know, Fish and Wildlife, ADM, Kawako, uh, Fish, uh, DCNR, Fish and Wildlife, all these people who have a common interest in protecting the resource not just for the sake of the animals but for the benefit of water being a, uh, an important resource in the world uh, it's important for industry, municipalities, 
recreation. You know, we all know that. But that's our goal is to uh, have watershed management plans to protect the species. And it all ties back into the mutual benefit of everybody in the state and surrounding states. And uh, so anyway, that's kind of a nutshell of the history of how it came to be and what it is. And I'll that's incredible. It I, I, I think from a lot of what I got from what you were talking about is just, well, that it isn't necessarily confined by um, like state lines, right? I mean, it is as far as the group, but a lot of these watersheds and, and the critters that live inside them that you guys are researching and, and trying to um, to uh, protect and to, to save really do have different um, states and different boundaries that affect them. So you have to work with lots of different people. And it also just sounds like you're doing so much work that there's a lot of people involved in this um, arson group, which is kind of incredible. Um, I think we had talked to where I think Rebecca maybe might have some more information about that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the partnership aspect of it? Sure, Allie, absolutely. Yeah, we're blessed to have not only state agencies who are partnering with us in this endeavor, but also federal agencies, nonprofits, and industry. Um, so I'll I'll rule off a few of those. I know we do have a slide with, with some of those partner logos on there as well, but they're also on our, yes. our website that we'll share shortly. Um, but in addition to the geological survey, um, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources here in Alabama has been a huge supporter, and we work with them very closely with all of our monitoring and fish surveys. Um, also, our Department of Environmental Management, um, they continue to be supportive and work together with water quality efforts. Our Alabama Forestry Commission, forestry has been a great um, asset to this group because so much of our land, 95% of our land in Alabama is privately owned and a lot of that is in forest land. So educating the people who own that land on how to do the best management practices for that land has been a huge help because this group is a grassroots group and any progress that we make is primarily based on volunteer efforts from the partners. So that's what really is the, the sustainability aspect of all of this is that this will be carried on because the people truly do care about these practices and will and will continue them. So in addition to forestry, the Alabama Department of uh, Transportation, we have them on board. Um, a lot of what we do are, are called stream crossings or road crossing surveys. We'll check out a, a culvert or a bridge crossing. And if it's impaired in any way, we're able to score that and then let the Department of Transportation know that once they have money available to fix those areas that, you know, here's the place where you need to go. Here's one of the more sensitive areas because of fish that need um, to be able to migrate from point A to point B. So we have a lot of fish passage mm -hmm. issues in the state. Um, and a lot of that is because of, of faulty culverts. So we're working with the Department of Transportation and getting a lot of that fixed. Um, federal partners, obviously the Fish and Wildlife Service is huge. Um, this, they've been the driving force behind this whole project. The U.S. Geological Survey, incredibly important because we use so much of their gauge data and we work with them on, on funding as well. Uh, recently, the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Services has joined in the team and we've been able to help funnel some of that farm bill money that the farmers are able to, to take advantage of and use our data to help drive where that money should go and how it's best used in these watersheds for these particular species that are that are of concern. Um, Corps of Engineers, clearly anything that has to do with water in the state of Alabama, and we work very closely with them and the U.S. Uh, Forest Service because we do have several national forests here in Alabama. They've been a great federal partner as well. Uh, private groups, again, going back to forestry, Westervelt, Weyerhaeuser, um, Alabama Power, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, Power South, we worked with all of those groups. They've been incredibly supportive and willing to volunteer their time and efforts for these restoration projects that we, we will take on. Um, as far as nonprofits, COACO, which uh, kind of is a um, shortened version for CUSA, I'm sorry, Cahaba Warrior CUSA. They're a uh, resource conservation and development council. Um, Kelly Johnston at COACO has been really instrumental in helping um, send money to the places that need it. Uh, so she's been really great at divvying out the resources accordingly. Uh, the Nature Conservancy that Stuart mentioned has been a huge partner um, there. They have the capability to actually physically fix in-stream issues um, with stream restoration. So we will partner heavily with them. There's a, a restoration project available 
we're really good for doing the monitoring and the assessment. Uh, what we lack is big equipment to actually fix those issues, but the Nature Conservancy has mm -hmm. that equipment and they're willing to, to go out and, and work on these streams. Uh, Forestry Association, another nonprofit, Alabama Water Watch, um, citizen science-based group that we work with uh, regarding yeah. water quality, and our river keepers throughout uh, the state. So we have Coosa River Keeper, Black Warrior River Keeper. Those guys are always on board and super involved. Uh, in addition, our universities, um, because we're based here on campus at the University of Alabama, GSA works closely with UA with all of their research. We're going to go into that in more detail later on. But Auburn University, uh, University of West Alabama, Jacksonville State, uh, Troy University. Uh, again, we're gaining more and more partners. Um, we started out, we used to meet, um, we do meet annually. And our meetings about five years ago consisted of maybe, you know, 12 to 15, maybe 20 people. Our last meeting, we had 60 to 70 people in attendance. So our group is definitely growing. We're definitely gaining traction um, statewide. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty incredible growth. So just in that short period of time, we've been able to really get the word out. And I think that's the most important part is the communication aspect of it. Once people find out the work you're doing, they usually want to be a part of that. Um, you know, our goals for arson, we want to ensure that there's, you know, adequate water supplies for the future. So water is our number one priority. You know, we want the citizens of Alabama to have access to clean water. Everybody, everyone deserves mm -hmm. access to clean water. So that's our overall goal. Um, we want to manage the watersheds for both the water quality and water yeah. quantity. Most people think this because we have so much fresh water, it's unlimited. We've got nothing to worry about. That is not the case. We really have to be more vigilant with how we use our water and helped direct research efforts towards determining how much water we actually have in the state. That's really key to this whole system. So in addition to you know restoring the water quality, the habitat, we come in with the biology aspect of it. And if you recover threatened and endangered species and work towards goals of ensuring their habitat is, is restored, then um, by default, you're actually making the water a lot cleaner. You're making the water a lot more accessible for people to be able to, uh, to have for drinking water. It's a lot cheaper, quote unquote, to treat when you, once it gets to the treatment plant. Um, if it's free of all of these pollutants, right. and sediment. Um, I know you talked to, uh, to that uh, point with Todd. So there's, um, there's an actual yeah. you know, in-pocket uh, advantage for the regular Alabama citizen here. So all this work is going towards making their water more accessible and, um, and more available. So again, some of the tools that we use federally funded programs, the Clean Water Act obviously has been a driving force for, for a lot of this work. Um, the Farm Bill, we mentioned that one. Um, the Endangered Species Act, we work within those frameworks to help channel some of the, the funding for research efforts. Uh, but again, a lot of what the success of this whole thing is the is the grassroots approach. You know, sometimes there is funding, sometimes there isn't funding uh, for these kind of efforts, but that still doesn't mean the work, you know, doesn't need to go on. And if we can kind of pitch this to people in, in the way that the private citizen and the landowner buys into it, you know, and is a part of it, then it's a lot more sustainable. It's a lot more um, reasonable uh, and it's something that can continue in the future. So there's a, a quick take home. And Stuart mentioned some of the watersheds that we're currently working in. Uh, we're all across the state. Uh, so if you are able to yeah. show that shoe map again, we can kind of throw that back up there, but all the way from way North Alabama in the beautiful paint rock, very pristine, beautiful watershed. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is working there um, as well as in the Cahaba. That's a little more local for folks here. Uh, but I know you've got listeners mm. that are in North Alabama as well. So they're familiar with some of these watersheds. A Locust Fork right outside of Birmingham, heading up towards Sand Mountain. Um, we've got a lot of restoration work going on in Locust Fork with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the Big Canoe Creek watershed, a little closer to home um, in, um, in that neck of the woods. Um, so again, Nature Conservancy is really good about just that on the ground, fixing the problems that, that need to be that need to be fixed there. Um, the Alabama Natural Heritage Program in Auburn, they're also working in lo Locust Fork Watershed. They have a huge interest in the uh, flattened musk turtle uh, and the black warrior water dog, two species of concern there. Um, so they have a lot of research work channeled towards that watershed. Uh, Turkey Creek Nature Preserve, if you guys have ever been out to Pinson, um, Charles Yeager and his crew have done a lot of work with the rush darter and some of the passage issues there. They've been able to replace some culverts to help 
uh, facilitate passage for that particular fish. It's a beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, fish and Wildlife has a partners program that they'll actually work with landowners statewide um, who are wanting to be a part of this effort. You know, so they can provide technical assistance, they can provide guidance, and they can actually hook landowners up with federal funds that are available um, to help restore some of these streams. A lot of it's, you know, old mill dams. If you've got a creek going through your place and you've got an old mill dam or some other old dam that's there, you know, that's that's creating a, a problem because you're kind of upsetting the balance of the stream. And those kinds of things need to come out, but they need to come out um, carefully. And so the Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. Service is really good about working with landowners to help them understand, you know, how, how these things can be removed in a, in a very safe way for, for everyone involved. Uh, Freshwater Land Trust, they've done a lot of work outside of uh, Birmingham and Roebuck Springs and the Cahaba River, uh, Turkey Creek as well. They have a really neat setup. Um, they call this the Litter Gitter, which is kind of cool. It's basically a <laughs> giant rope system that goes across the creek that actually catches the litter that goes down the, the stream. A lot of these urban efforts are, have been really productive uh, and, uh, and effective. Um, Power South, we mentioned them. Uh, they have a huge muscle relocation uh, set up down in uh, Gantt Lake in South Alabama. So if you've ever been towards Andalusia or you're from South Alabama, sometimes those dams have to be uh, drawn down or, um, or the lakes have to be drawn down because the dams have to be repaired, worked on, whatnot. Well, there's a lot of species of mussels and other animals that are in those lakes. So Power South wants to make sure that they're, um, they're taken care of. So they do a big relocation effort every year um, and involve several partners with that um, undertaking. Um, cannot miss the Alabama Aquatic Biodiversity Center out of Marion, Paul Johnson and his crew. They do an incredible job with mussel relocation statewide in many of these shoes. Um, they've gotten from Bear Creek in North Alabama and Paint Rock, um, Shoal Creek, Locust Fork, Duck River, Little River, Cahaba, all of these places. You know, we're lucky to have so many freshwater resources uh, and so many mussel species, crayfish species, uh, fish species. We have more aquatics than any other state. So we're proud of that. And we also wanna make sure that we continue uh, to hold that number one spot when it comes to our freshwater biodiversity. So uh, the guys- We're are, number one. We're yeah, number, one. number one. And more than just football. Yeah, we can rock it out. Um, so again, the, uh, G the GSA, we've been involved in shoes statewide, these watersheds working with everything you can imagine. You know, really, we love doing fish surveys, habitat surveys, water quality surveys, you know, you name it. If it has to do with a, a stream organism or stream habitat, uh, we are there. Um, and we enjoy working statewide with all of our partners. So a lot of what we try and do, in addition to the actual field work, we'll take all that data once we get back, you know, from the field into the office and someone has to coalesce that data, interpret that data and try and help other people understand what does all of this mean? You know, that's our job as researchers. So we create assessments. And we have several assessments for these different strategic habitat units that we've produced as part of the geological survey um, bulletin series and, um, uh, and uh, circular series. We have several different versions of our publications, but those are available to the public um, because we, uh, we wanna get that information out there. Uh, we have assessments already completed for the North River Shoe, uh, the Big Canoe Creek Shoe, Terrapin Creek. And then we also have um, fish reports um, that help outline what the fish community is like for Locust Fork and Murder Creek, um, the Sipsy River, and the Choctawhatchee River. And we have a map coming out pretty soon. We also do special maps uh, on the Bear Creek watershed in that shoe that helps readers understand where there is um, healthy fish habitat and where there is habitat that needs help, essentially. Um, so we're lucky to, to be a part of that. So that's sort of our goal at the, at the end of the day is to take all of this information and make it user-friendly for, for people who want to, one, you know, understand what is the condition like in these watersheds? And two, when there's federal funding available or any kind of funding available, we can help direct that money more efficiently when we know where those problems are. So that's our goal, right. is to pinpoint the places that need the help. If I could, I so, have one thing right there. If I could jump in real quick, uh, what she just said, uh, with the uh, directing federal dollars, like in the NRCS protocol, Natural Resource Conservation Service, they provide funds for farmers to fix problems they may have and it's a scoring criteria that goes into their determination of who gets what kind of help and if it's in a shoe that gives it a little bump 
it gets a nickel oh, okay. for that. So they've accepted it at that level. And I think it's being followed in other places nationally as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a good tool. Yeah, our, our setup is is definitely being taken to some of the uh, representatives from Fish and Wildlife have taken this um, to DC and other states are so impressed with how effective it's been that they want to implement something similar. Um, Stuart's been working with some people in Tennessee who are trying to do something uh, on that same scale when it comes to, you know, a grassroots watershed effort and other states throughout are like, you know, these guys in Alabama, that this seems to be really working. You're like, what's your secret? So we're trying to not only work in-house to do what we need to do, you know, in our backyards, but also uh, spread the word, share, share the love uh, to other states as well, to let them know, like, this is effective. Uh, and it just takes the right kind of communication to make it happen. It, it sounds like maybe a nice theme from all of this is stronger together, right? Yeah. <laughs> Working definitely. together. Well, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So quick side note, just so I can show off a little bit, but I knew we were going to talk about muscles. And so I wore, I showed these guys earlier, but I want to show everybody. I wore my muscle themed jewelry today on purpose. Look at that. Look at that. It's not fresh water, but that's okay. It's close enough. Anyway, muscles are one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. All this, they just, they're the coolest things. Crayfish are kind of amazing too. I'm getting to learn them a little bit more. Um, but it sounds like I can learn more about all of these things if I get to, you know, see all the, or if I take advantage of all the data that you guys are putting together and um, are communicating well. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were talking about a lot of the projects that are happening, um, I'll, what other, you, but you talked a lot about like communicating. So is there any, do you guys do any outreach or anything too? Or is it, I know you're communicating through um, um, maps that are created and things like that. Um, are there programs that you do as well uh, to communicate with the public? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We get requests from high school teachers, elementary teachers, um, workshops that are, you know, um, natural resource career related. Uh, we have several across the gamut. Once people hear about what we do, they're like, oh, well, you know, I have a student who she's sort of interested in fish or she thinks that mussels are cool. You know, can you please sort of mentor her along and um, ends up being a, you know, a nice effort to be able to reach out sort of a STEM focus for, um, for not only K through 12, but, but also landowners, you know, we're looking to uh, through workshops that we partner with the Forestry Commission or Forestry Association um, and other groups in RCS, you know, to generate to, to sort of get the word out to the landowner as well. Um, and a lot of people, if they just kind of know what's going on, they'll they'll buy into it as long as you sort of get them into the loop. Um, the biggest challenge that we have is that we're perceived as, quote unquote, the government. You know, we're not trying to regulate. We are not regulatory. Uh, we are simply here to gather data and provide, um, you know, some suggestions for, for what could, could happen to make things better. So once you bring everybody to the table, that makes that a lot easier. And one way we do that is through these workshops um, and then having the website at alh2o.org. And you're going to put that up there eventually, but that one's a good um, place to sort of see what we're doing and where we're going. And if you want to see specifically in each watershed where we're working and what's been done, uh, we've partnered with the USGS to help host a, um, a shoe mapper is what we call it, but it's an interactive map. Uh, we can throw that link up there as well. Oh, cool. um, so people can literally click on that watershed and see, you know, what fish surveys are there, uh, what water quality surveys have been done. Um, so we, we're keeping that as, as best we can up to date in real time to make that available for the public. And you can kind of see as we, as we move through, that's something that we've, had pretty good success with um, with posting our data. So there's our you know, ALH2O site, and you can um, cruise around that to find out what we're all about and where we're working. And there's also a link through that site to the shoe mapper um, to help guide you to see specifically what's going on in each of these watersheds. That's but incredible. Great, great resource for people. And I know the link to this and, and the other ones that we're talking about today will all be available in the description box um, below these videos. So when people want to um, go and, and, you know, like you said, surf through that website, which I know that I will be doing immediately after this live stream, um, they can find that link in those uh, directions there in the description boxes for these videos. Absolutely. Um, wow. So you get, I mean, you guys are busy, like really busy and doing incredible, important work. 
That's an interesting. I might I have just, uh, a lot of support. If I may, I'll, I'll say we have a lot of support from the state geologist, Nick Tew, and our uh, chief of staff and assistant state geologist, Bennett Beard, and they really give us free reign to, to go out and find opportunities like this to communicate with y'all and other organizations to spread uh, our information and share and learn from other people. So there's really some good coordinated uh, efforts out there about different organizations and it helps to be able to do live streams like this. You know? Yes. <laughs> um, so I think you guys mentioned a little bit about partnering maybe with, uh, with UA a little, is that right? Yeah, we have a great resource in that since we're right here on campus, the University of Alabama is doing some great work um, in the uh, in the water world, and we're also blessed to have the uh, NOAA presence on campus with the National Water Center. Um, so mm -hmm. we're going to yeah segue into that because my good friend and colleague Henry Pitts uh, and his lab mate Austin Rainey are going to chat about what's going on and how great and wonderful UA research is. Awesome. All right. So Henry, um, talk a little bit about what is the National Water Center. I think you're on mute, though, Henry. Oh, Henry, I think if you can hear me, I think you might have a muted mic. I'm sorry. Yes, I do that every time I have these, <laughs> these web-based calls. Um, but yeah, I kind of like Rebecca said, I'm a student at UA. I'm an undergrad. Um, and so kind of growing up, um, I've always been interested in water. Um, Stuart McGregor actually mentioned my mother, Mary Pitts is my mom. So I kind of had that family dynasty of water in Alabama. Um, so when it came time <laughs> to pick a college, um, UA's really t close ties with the National Water Center and with groups like GSA made UA really appealing. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, you know, what is the National Water Center? Um, and Austin, I know you did the Summer Institute there. So if you feel free to jump in and correct me or add any details if you want. Um, but yeah, so kind of similar to Arson, National Water Center um, really focuses on a ton of interagency collaboration. Um, but whereas Arson kind of has a lot of state-based agencies and partnerships, and they kind of do have those federal agencies present, um, the National Water Center kind of zooms out of that kind of regional scale approach and kind of looks at the U.S. as a whole continent. Um, so when it was originally kind of conceived, the idea was that it would be a complementary resource to the existing National Weather Service kind of regional river forecasting centers, um, mm -hmm. which were using kind of like the height of computer modeling for water quality and water quantity at the time. Um, but kind of a lot of federal agencies saw a need for a kind of continental scale overarching group for the entire nation. Um, so due to a lot of kind of lobbying and advocate, advocacy from Senator Shelby, uh, Tuscaloosa and UA were lucky enough to get the National Water Center on our campus. Um, so there you have uh, employees from NOAA, you have employees from USGS, employees from FEMA, um, and they're all there kind of working on what's called the National Water Model, um, which is kind of a gross oversimplification of the National Water Model is essentially you could understand how a rain event in the northern U.S. could eventually trickle all the way down to the southeast if they finally calibrated it enough. So it's actually a really, really cool model, um, and it's really, really exciting. It's kind of cutting-edge um, computer simulation. Um, and the really cool thing about the National Water Center and kind of all of these things with interagency collaboration is they're kind of working to reduce redundancy among groups. So kind of like with Arson, you have all these groups working towards a common goal, which is improved water quality and improved water resources for our state. And having those groups like the National Water Center where you can collaborate and make sure you're not kind of overlapping each other with use of funds or use of data is incredibly useful. Um, so for example, Rebecca mentioned kind of using USGS stream flow gauges, and that's a huge part of that forecasting in the national water model. Um, you know, the National Weather Service also needs those gauges and needs their data. So in collaboration under the National Water Center, the National Weather Service is actually allowed to install sensors on those USGS gauges. So both of those agencies can use that data. Um, yeah. So yeah, the National Water Center is just a really cool, cohesive group of federal agencies working together. Um, and in the Surface Dynamics Modeling Lab, which is the lab I'm a part of at UA, we use a lot of that USGS streamflow data and the National Water Model to kind of further our research efforts, which Austin can kind of talk about a little more specifically. Um, I kind of support him in his graduate role in the lab. Excellent. 
Austin, you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on? Yeah, certainly. And, and thanks, Henry. That was an excellent description um, and, and depiction of what the National Water Model and Center, uh, their, their role is in the, the broader picture of water prediction and uh, their role, you know, in, in water as, as it is. So uh, in, the, in the lab currently, uh, I'm, I'm going to zoom out just a second. So I'm, we're part of the Surface Dynamics Modeling uh, Lab Group on the campus of the University of Alabama and the geography department. Um, we, yeah, that'd be great if you could pull up our, our website. Um, our, our group focuses on large scale hydrological modeling, um, specifically how humans impact, um, impact water and sediment. Uh, so if, you're, if you've ever been to a river, um, it's not just water flowing down through that river. There's also suspended particles um, that, you know, are, transporting either nutrition to uh, to the watershed or uh, a multitude of things. And it's important to understand, you know, how much of that is discharging down the river. So we, we have some people looking at that, which is really interesting. Um, we're also really interested in flood forecasting and mapping, um, as well as uh, there's a, a student currently who's working on looking at uh, deltas in particular around the world. Um, and how deltas are growing or um, are decaying through time due to human impacts um, and, and not not just human impacts, but just in general. Um, so we, we definitely take a, a broader lens in comparison to what Rebecca and and Stuart presented today. But we still have a um, we still have a love for you know, our, our state and kind of the smaller watershed uh, perspective. We're all here uh, at trying to reach a common goal. So that's what our lab does in particular. Um, so in particular, how are we uh, you know, leveraging what the National Water Model and National Water Center are doing in, in our lab? Um, there, myself and another student um, are currently undergoing some projects. The, the other student, Anushka, is looking at um, soil moisture um, so soil moisture, you you might not think it would come to mind if you're thinking about a hydrological model, um, but it's incredibly important. We had a huge rainstorm here in Tuscaloosa last night, and when that rain comes down, it propagates into the soil column, um, and the, you can think of it as a sponge. So if you fill up your sponge, then the water can't can't go into it. It's going to run off more. Um, the same yeah. thing happens if you have too much water um and you know the it just runs straight off the sponge there's too much of it um so that's that's uh the term is runoff and that's incredibly important for how watershed or how water gets to watersheds especially in the southeast and more tropical regions um so she's uh, anushka is specifically looking at soil moisture representation in the national water model and can we leverage using um remote sensing, which is using satellites um, that have sensors on them that can detect uh, the amount of soil moisture that is in the water column at a particular time. Um, so similar to what uh, Henry was mentioning with these kind of these gauge stations that are on rivers, can we use gauges in the sky? Can we look at the globe and determine how much moisture is in the soil and then uh, give that information to our model to then help us predict how much water is going to come out, um, you know, downstream. So that's kind of a, a meta big, big thought, uh, or broader way to think of it. But uh, that that's part of the collaboration that we're doing. Um, what I'm doing in particular is is also using remote sensing, so using satellites. But I'm more interested in flooding because flooding impacts us every single, uh, or impacts someone every single day. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm using remote sensing and I'm trying to determine the, the river widths um, of watersheds across the US and uh, take that information and disseminate it and input it into these models. Um, because if you can have a, a better representation of you know, what the actual river looks like in your model, uh, we're hoping that that's going to uh, reach an outcome where we can better uh, 
better predict flooding downstream. So mm -hmm. if you can, if you know what the channel looks like um, and you know how much water is coming into that channel, we're hoping that you can determine, okay, it's, there might be water coming out of this part of the channel. Um, and that's going to be really important for decision makers and stakeholders um, at, at not just the, the state level, but at the, I know <clears throat> in particular, uh, you were talking about Alabama earlier, the tag region, the Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia uh, area is plagued with water issues and being able to provide stakeholders and states with information and better forecasts of what is to come is only going to help us uh, improve our decision-making process and saving lives and property uh, in the, in the future. So. Also, you are also very busy. It sounds like that's kind of, it's incredible. I mean, that data, I mean, everything that you guys are working on impacts us, I think in, I mean, in everyday life, but maybe in ways that we don't necessarily see or think about, right? You know, like it's not always in our face necessarily, but it's, I don't know, it's informing us, like you said, helping us, helping people, helping us create or um, make more informed decisions, um, not just about, you know, human impact, but also impact for the critters and life that live in our, our rivers and streams. Um, man, my head's just buzzing. There's a lot, you guys have, you guys are doing a lot of great work. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. Um, so I was thinking about all this, and I, I know that you guys are talking, it sounds like, um, like you said, you're all working toward a common goal, and you guys are all um, working um, with the same sort of, you know, water being the base of it all. But if I were to ask you what got you into what you're doing now, why, like, what inspired you, what brought you to water, what would you guys say? What made you guys decide to want to do the work that you're doing now? Well, I guess from my perspective, when I was in college uh, at the University of North Alabama in my hometown of Florence, they started offering environmental biology as a major. And I thought, that sounds pretty cool. I like to hunt and fish. I like the outdoors and all that. So I pursued that, went through the you know, undergraduate school at Tennessee Tech and wound up in Tuscaloosa about 32 years ago. And <laughs> did work with fishes and then eventually I saw muscle shells lying around. I thought, well, I can pick up the shells and get me a book and put a name on them. I found out it's not that easy. So about 1989 <laughs> or so I got some muscles and uh, over the years, uh, I did about all the surveys I could do in Alabama for muscles and Paul Johnson and those guys over at AABC and Jeff Garner with DCNR were doing, you know, carrying the torch and restoring the muscles and you know, identified where they were missing, where there were problems and, and they're going back and fixing things. And then, uh, crayfish research came along when conservation decided to add them to their uh, state wildlife action plan as a, you know, the lar next largest group of animals that did, they didn't know much about, you know, deer, turkey, and bass and catfish. We got that figured out, you know, with mussels, snails, kind of working down the chain. And so crayfish were the next uh, charismatic megafauna, so to speak, that needed some attention. And conservation <laughs> they and are. They're adorable. With, <laughs> um, uh, Illinois Natural History Survey and Eastern Kentucky University. And then that's evolving into a book, hopefully, and it's led to Rebecca's research on crayfishes. And hopefully that will flourish. You know, that's one of the largest groups of relatively unknown. We have 97 species that we know of in Alabama. And I'm, I'm entirely certain there's probably five or 10 more we'll find over time. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of how I got into doing what I'm doing. And then working with Fish and Wildlife and all those others to form the arson team has been a a great boon to what we do. That's great yeah, to talk. Yeah, to tie that in with with Stewart's, um, you know, path. Certainly, growing up in Alabama, uh, being from, being a native, uh, you you can't miss how many wonderful recreational opportunities we have with our with our waterways and hunting and fishing opportunities. And generally speaking, you know, a love for the outdoors and a love for the land. I think is instilled in most um, in most Alabamians and, and not just Alabama, but for sure our state is um, because we are so blessed with so many water resources and uh, with so many aquatic species. If you grow up in that environment and you're blessed to have parents and teachers and mentors who help show you that at a young age. And I was definitely one of those people. My parents were always teaching me about what lives in the creek, um, how important it is. 
uh, and then also being tied back to the land through agriculture, uh, which we still are a part of, you know, you just get a sense of the community that that is Alabama and, and how people do care and want to do the right thing, even if their current practices aren't exactly up to snuff for what needs to be done for that particular area. Once they learn what what needs to be done, you know, they're more willing to listen to you. So just having that community background has been um, was sort of my driving force for going into all things wildlife related. Um, so after going through wildlife science at Auburn uh, and then working for uh, the Wildlife Federation, a nonprofit as a conservation education specialist for seven years, um, then I decided to go the research route and started working at the geological survey. And Stuart McGregor definitely put me on to crayfish. And so now I'm <laughs> I decided to go back to school and get a PhD in Alabama. Still, still working on that. And <laughs> burrowing crayfish, probably for another year, we hope. Uh, burrowing crayfish uh, is the topic of my dissertation. So we're looking at habitat. We're looking at behavior. Um, a lot of these burrowers, particularly the primary burrowers, most people are, are familiar with at least seeing their chimneys when you walk around a stream or when you walk through a swamp. Uh, these guys spend most of their lives in their burrows. They rarely have any contact with surface water. So they're using that groundwater, that shallow groundwater, as their main water source. And because of that, they're really cryptic. Some of them are really hard to study. Um, and there's not a lot of literature on them. So I chose that for my um, dissertation focus, hoping to sort of blaze some new trails in that direction uh, with some some groundbreaking research. At least it's foundational <laughs> research. So hopefully whatever I come up with is publishable, fingers crossed. Uh, but we know <laughs> about these guys. And so trying to figure out why they live in their burrow, what they do in their burrow, you know, spend so much time underground. What, what's that life all about? Uh, but it all ties back. And because some of these are kind of considered like considered to be semi-terrestrial species because they're so far away from the surface water. When you look at management plans for these species, you really have to tie back the terrestrial world and the aquatic world. And so they're kind of the connector between the two. So that's the beauty of it as well. Um, so with our strategic habitat units, we're right now focused strictly on the aquatics, but we are branching out, um, you know, up the stream bank into the woods to kind of see how all of it works together um, in these watersheds. So uh, in the future, we'll definitely be addressing more terrestrial species as part of the, the restoration plans as well as the aquatics, because it is a system, as you well know, and they do all work together. So understanding how the ecology plays into everything is, is probably the most most challenging and the most exciting part of my job is understanding water chemistry, crayfish ecology, you know, forestry. You sort of have to try and learn to do a little bit of everything, but it never gets boring. That's for sure. Well, and like you said, none of these aspects of watershed, they're in a vacuum. They all work together. Ecosystems, yeah. all about them working together. Also, if crayfish ever need uh, marketing and branding advice, I feel like they could go with cryptic charismatic crayfish you know like i feel like you guys just made a whole marketing yeah. strategy for branding strategy for for charismatic cryptic i mean we can we can play with the wording a little bit alliterations <laughs> involved there's good words involved i feel yes. like i feel like crayfish have got it got it go. now we just need a logo and a website and some other stuff and it's good <laughs> making yeah. those we'll t-shirts yeah we're going <laughs> um henry how'd you get into water yeah, um, I kind of like to joke that it was inescapable in my future to end up in the kind of the water related realm. Um, <laughs> kind of like I said, you know, my mom managed the watershed when I was growing up. She's a hydrogeologist um, and she teaches classes at UA kind of around water and natural resources. So kind of growing up, I had that home influence. Um, you know, no one ever wants to do exactly what their parents do. Um, so I always kind of thought that I'd end up doing something completely different. Um, you know, Rebecca and Stuart both mentioned Pat O'Neill, um, who used to work for GSA, and he was actually my scoutmaster. Um, so I was kind of getting it from both sides at home and in my Boy Scout troop growing up. Um, <laughs> so it really, it really was kind of inevitable. Um, I spent a lot of summers in high school kind of doing long distance backpacking trips in New Mexico at Philmont Scout Ranch. Um, mm. I, kind of, I remember hiking throughout those landscapes and all of my scout masters was pointing out the various natural features and explaining arroyos and water and like flash flooding issues in the Southwest. Um, and then coming back to the East Coast and being in the Southeast and just kind of like Rebecca said, Alabama has so many natural 
um, water resources. We really do an abundance there. Um, and kind of through a class that I'm taking this semester with Bennett Bearden, just kind of understanding kind of the lack of policy protection that we have in our state. Um, so kind of, yeah, I kind of had that outdoor recreation approach um, initially, um, and then kind of through um, Dr. Bearden, I think I'm definitely swinging more towards water policy in the future. Um, okay. But yeah, there was no way I was never going to end up in water, honestly. So. <laughs> you, yeah, you really did, like you said, get, you got it from all sides. <laughs> You jumped in both feet. Before you even knew that, I feel like you were in the pool. Like you heard it there. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Austin, awesome. what about you? How did you get in? Oh, yeah. Like you've been by the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Your, your mom, mom is, is, is. You are wonderful and your mom is wonderful. Everyone's wonderful. <laughs> Pitts family. Austin, how did you get into this kind of research? Um, so my. It, Kind of like Henry, it was also a lineage thing that I, I didn't necessarily know that it was that I was, you know, supposed to be in water science. Uh, my, my grandfather was a professor at the university for 30 years in uh, the engineering mechanics and did a lot of stuff with uh, fluid dynamics and actually did some of the first modeling of Mobile Bay and the salinity transport down in the estuary. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it's kind of sad. I, I didn't know exactly to, that he had done that until I was, you know, head deep into water science. Um, <laughs> I, or I had read through some of his, he had done some stuff at, you know, at NASA and at other organizations. I knew about that, but I had no clue that he was so involved in kind of some early, uh, water modeling. Um, so, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned earlier outreach. Um, SDML does a great job of doing outreach to undergrads and uh, trying to get undergraduates involved and really investing in them that, hey, this is, a, this is what research is. We, you, you can do this, you can have fun with it, and this is something that you can enjoy and uh, you know, make, make a, a big part of your life. Um, and that's exactly what Dr. Cohen did for me in undergrad. I, um, I had no idea, had no, um, I, I was not going to do water science. I was in computer science um, and was going to go out to California and do startup stuff. And I ended up doing um, some work with Dr. Cohen, ended up changing majors and uh, fell in love with, with water and with flooding. And um, it, it's kind of history, history ever since. So, um, that, that's, that's, that's incredible. It's, I, it sounds like the underlying theme for everyone is you were maybe caught by the water bug either early on or later on in life. And then just there's like an underlying passion and um, sense of importance about the work that really drives you to what you're doing. Would you guys, do you think I maybe said that right? I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It sounds... Yeah. And especially like with Arson and with the groups that you guys are in the uh, uh, water center and the groups that you're working with, everyone that's there is really, um, sounds like, you know, like, like you said, working toward a common goal, working together, sharing resources, sharing expertise, and really fueled by that passion and that um, desire to see this work, you know, done, to see it because it needs to be done, like you're saying. Absolutely. Excellent. So um, I think if we were, uh, we have just a couple minutes left. So is there anything that we maybe didn't cover that we need to cover? Anything that um, kind of got overlooked a little bit? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. My cats just jumped crazy into the window. That was scary. <laughs> like head first into a glass window. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Oh, we could probably go on for hours and hours about water issues in the state, but one that's of importance right now are in the invasives, you know, coming in, uh, oh. sneaking in other fish species. And uh, we three of the crayfish that we know of from Alabama are not native to the state. They've been brought in from elsewhere, either through perhaps bait bucket in, introductions or through um, uh, uh, fish stocking. You know, people out, they say, in Arkansas, oh, raise okay. a lot of fish, and then they ship them here. They scoop them up with a net, and then they catch everything in the pond. They bring crayfish with them incidentally, accidentally. No one meant to do it maliciously, right. but they're established, and they're here, and they're competitive. They bring new diseases. Uh, you know, there's the uh, 
Uh, most everybody's probably heard of the uh, uh, Asian clam and, and other invasive yeah. uh, uh, things like that that just kind of take over and squeeze out the natives. You know? and, uh, uh, Is that, Jim, do, you guys, do you guys in Arson do work with those two with invasive species? Well, we certainly document them when we encounter them. And then they're in our reports. We include them and pass the word along. Jeff Garner yeah. and I were down, down on the uh, Black Warrior River a couple of years ago and found the first Mobile Basin record of the zebra mussel, which many people know. Oh, wow. A great deal of damage up in the Great Lakes. We in the South were thinking, oh, it's so hot here. They won't be able to take it. They're from the Caspian Sea. They came, entered the U.S. in uh, 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 ballast water from ships coming from the from the Europe and Asia. And... Uh, took hold in the Great Lakes and they caused a great deal of damage. I once judged a student paper at a meeting once, a woman who had done research on a gravel bar mussel community in Lake Erie and she said she found three zebra mussels per square meter and six months later found 750,000 per square meter and the water in Lake Michigan oh was pure because there were no, nothing left in it because the zebra mussels sucked all the nutrients out of the water, their filter feeders, you know, so they are a problem and they caused a great deal of damage, billions of dollars in the upper Midwest. And uh, eventually they've trickled down the Tennessee river and they kind of boom and bust in the Shoals area, of the Tennessee river. But we found them a few individuals in the black warrior a couple of years ago, whether or not they'll take hold, I think heat will suppress them to some degree, but uh, that's noteworthy. You know, people need to know them. zebra mussels are out there. You need to clean your ballast. You know, all this stuff needs to be done. There's certain things that need to be done. So yeah, we do address them. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, it looks like, oh yeah, that's great. So um, Todd Hester, who we talked to last week about watersheds, um, worked with us at the museum and we did a watershed festival for years and years and years. And we're hoping to bring it back. Um, for the city and everyone's hoping to maybe bring it back this year, but the survey was always involved. I don't, we haven't mentioned this yet, but the Natural History Museum where I work and the survey where um, Rebecca and Stuart work are, we're parking lot neighbors, which is very exciting. Um, we compete for parking spaces <laughs> on an everyday basis. <laughs> no, but um, we work closely, not only as colleagues like this, but also for parking spaces. But um, that, you know, the survey and the museum were involved in that watershed festival and that type of outreach, that big community type event where a lot of this information gets, you know, brought out to, it was, we were teaching mostly fourth graders at the time. Um, but uh, we really enjoyed that event and would love to see the survey come back again or see the event come back again and then partner with all of these agencies that we're talking about here. And I feel like it would also be really interesting to bring the uh, the lab that Henry and Austin work at too, because um, a lot of the information that you guys have, I think would be important to, to get kids involved in as well. Um, but so it sounds like we, you guys gave us a ton of resources um, to share with everyone, and I know that those have been pulled up. Thank you, Rebecca. Other, other sure. Rebecca Johnson. We have so many Rebeccas on the stream. It's pretty great. Um, <laughs> thank you for posting those and bringing those up as we were talking. And I know that they're in the description boxes below in the link. Um, do we have any? And we're getting toward the end today, but do we have any like parting thoughts or parting words that we want to? You guys would like to say. I, I first off would like to the say opportunity to meet with so many people and I know people have been commenting over on the side there and the with different links to different things and, and you will put our links up and hopefully this will snowball and more and more people will come involved. And thank you all for doing that. Absolutely. This. No, I, thank, thank you for everything. Sorry, Ellie. I guess I'll just say one thing, and I think someone did touch on this, um, but you know, at the end of the day, all of this science can kind of seem so obtuse and far-fetched away from your everyday life, and how does it affect the citizens of Alabama? Um, and I think it's really important to remember that all of the data that we're collecting through GSA, through the SDML, through the National Water Center, drives good science, and all of that science drives the policy and the suggestions that we're looking to put in place that do affect the everyday citizens. So supporting good science and supporting data collection does have a direct impact on the citizens of Alabama. So I'll just encourage people to remember that as well. Excellent. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you all for what you do. And uh, I'm starting to realize through these live streams and through working with uh, the Alabama Museum of Natural History that uh, water is much more important than we give it credit for. So I appreciate you all sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us today. I think that's going to do it for this Museums from Your Home live stream. We'll be doing this every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. And each day we'll feature a different aspect of UA Museums. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be coming back to the Alabama Museum of Natural History's Facebook page uh, to do some more Family Friday activities. So if you would be interested in that, come back and join us tomorrow. And uh, I guess I could pull this up. Uh, if you're interested in uh, what we're doing and want to support what we're doing here, you can definitely uh, support us through give.ua.edu slash museums. Uh, that's a great way to support us there. And for a full list of uh, all the stuff that we're doing, the live stream schedule, the educational resources from Discovering Alabama, from Moundville Archaeological Park, from the Alabama Museum of Natural History, we have a bunch of educational resources that you can pull from at museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. Uh, and uh, that will be your one-stop shop for everything that we are doing here. Well, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us. Thank you to all the, the panelists here that we have with us this morning. And thank you to everybody who watched live. And thank you to everybody who's going to watch this in the future. Uh, thank you to, uh, to everybody who was uh, visiting UA Museums from your home. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.